Colin is the CEO of Photoshop Cafe. He's one of the best instructors out there. As you'll see, he's uh, got some great resources, free training resources, and these great training videos too. So I really encourage you to visit his uh, website. So Colin, I'm gonna go ahead and let you take it away here. And uh, everybody sit back and enjoy. Well, thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction there. So uh, how's everybody this morning? I hope you're doing well. So I'm in uh, nice sunny California. And um, so I'm Colin Smith, as you know, and I'm the founder of Photoshop Cafe. This is my website here. It's been going for about 14 years. It's a um, training resource. Um, this particular rendition of the site hasn't been going for 14 years, though. This is a new, and we're actually just launched it. Um, I've still got to change the banner up here at the top. We're actually rebuilding that today. But apart from that, everything else is good to go. So I just want to make you aware quickly, um, you know, there's a bunch of different resources on here. And really what it's about, it's about uh, free training and free resources. So if you go under the free resources, you can see we've got everything broken into categories now. So if I just click on here really quick, I just want to show you some of the, um, we've got all these different categories. So if you're looking for photo tutorials or special effects, different things, you can just click the categories there. And then we'll scroll down. And as we scroll down, you can roll over these and you can get a little description of what it is before you go into the tutorial. As you'll notice here, we've got little badges at the bottom. So some of these are step-by-step. -step. Those are written tutorials, and some of these are video tutorials. Um, and we've also got articles you can see here. So it'll tell you what type of um, tutorial it is before you go in there. If you prefer one type over the other, we've got a little bar here where we can actually click in there. You can filter these just by videos, um, by articles, or step-by-step. -step. And just one other thing I'm going to show you about this, because you know our whole goal here is to make it easy for you to learn and find what you're looking for. Um, so here's one here, and you'll notice we've also got ingredients. If you click on that ingredients, it'll actually filter and show you all the different tutorials that we have that also teach the same thing. So say you wanted to learn about channels or layers or whatever, you could click on that, and that'll bring all of those up for you. So um, these are all free, as I said. And these are all original tutorials that are exclusive to Photoshop Cafe, so you can just go in and enjoy those. Uh, the other thing I just want to mention really quick here is we've got the store here. So if I just click on the store, this is also broken into categories. These are all the different training videos we have, and these can go up to 13 hours. These are anywhere from 90 minutes to 13 hours worth of training. And the one I want to highlight right now is this one here, the DJI Phantom Quadcopter Drone Aerial Video and Photography Handbook. I know that's a mouthful, um, but this here is nine hours on working with the DJI Phantoms, everything from flying them, we're out on location and stuff, um, to you know setting them up, changing propellers, battery care, all that kind of stuff, software, firmware updates. Um, and then obviously shooting photos and shooting nice video with them, and then also how to edit and make those photos and videos look great, which is what we're going to do this morning. We're actually going to go in and have a look at the photos. We're not going to be talking about video today, but we are going to be talking about the photos. These are all available as digital downloads or uh, physical disks. Um, so I'm going to get out of there, and we're just going to jump right in now to Bridge, and we're going to get started. So. I got bitten by this bug, this aerial photography bug, um, a little bit of over a year and a half ago now, um, how time flies. And uh, let's have a look here. I'm just going to pop this open and show you some different ones here. <clears throat> so these are um, the three different models that I currently possess. Um, actually, I have a fourth one as well now, but um, the one here in the bottom, in the middle there, this was my first one. Um, well, my second first one. <laughs> My very first one actually is in the bottom of the ocean. So uh, one of the things you want to do when you first get these, <clears throat> that they're, they're very easy to fly, but um, it takes a little bit of practice sometimes because you're not sure what direction they're facing. Um, you probably don't want to take them over water for your first few months until you get really, really comfortable with these. Um, so as I said, they're easy to fly, but they take quite a bit of practice to really get the control that you really want. So this one here, <clears throat> as I said, is my second first one. And uh, this one here is called Biggles. And then my next one here was this one here. This is the DJI uh, Phantom 2. And this is the Vision. And this has the built-in camera, DJI's camera. And this one here is Snoopy. 
And then we go over here. This is the latest model they have right now is the Phantom 2 Vision Plus. And this is basically the same shell, the same uh, quadcopter, but it has a different camera on it. And this camera has a three axis gimbal, which means that the camera will stay st uh, stable. So as this moves around, it uses um, satellites to lock the position and the location of the quadcopter and, and, and enables you to get um, really uh, stable shooting. And uh, the problem with the old one without the gimbal is when it would bank side to side, the camera would move and also get a lot of shakes so the video wasn't really usable. With the three axis gimbal, you can get very smooth and stable video as well as really good photographs. And the camera's been improved as well. And then there's the fourth one that I'm not showing uh, right now. Oh, by the way, this one here is, um, <clears throat> this is Buzz. So I have another one now, um, Snoopy 2, which is a Phantom 2 shell here. And it has a three axis uh, gimbal with the GoPro Hero 3 Plus on it. And soon that'll be a Hero 4 um, very soon here. And that's great because now I can shoot 4K video. And one of the questions I always get asked of people, what is the best one for me? And um, I really, the best one, it really depends on a couple of things, like what is your budget? Um, you know, be aware that <laughs> most people are, you know, mentally speaking, uh, I kind of put myself in a position of, you know, I'm going to lose my first one or I'm going to crash or I'm going to destroy my first one. So, you know, if you just want to learn how to fly first, you could pick up these shells for about 400 bucks for an original Phantom if you wanted. If you just wanted to fly around, if you were a little bit more reckless and crazy. If you're more conservative and you're not going to be good flying like a madman and you're just going to be um, just moving into position and taking photographs and your videos and you're not trying to do any stunts, then by all means jump into one of the, one of the more complete ones. So the cool thing about this one here, the Phantom 2 Vision Plus, is it comes out of the box with the camera, the gimbal, it has a uh, display which will work on your mobile phone. It has an app that you can control the camera from. Now you can adjust the tilt of the camera. Um, you can see what the camera sees. That's known as first person view. You can actually see through the camera. Same with the Vision 2. Um, but this particular one here takes very, very good photographs. It's a, an excellent craft for photos. You take it right out of the box, start flying, you can take fantastic photos. The limitation is the video is only 1080. So if you're wanting to do more high resolution video and maybe pull still images or photographs from the video, then you might want to do uh, like my other one that I, I'm not showing there, but it looks very much like this with the gimbal and the GoPro on it because the GoPro can shoot video now up to 4K at 30 frames per second. The old um, GoPro Hero 3 and 3 Plus can still do 4K, but only at 15 frames per second which is great for pulling photographs off there, but not very good if you want to get video as well. However, you know, with the GoPro 3 and the 3 Plus, you can shoot video 2.7K. So in other words, you can shoot really, really good video and you can get good still images with the GoPro model. And I'm using the three axis uh, DJI gimbal on that. And also I've got that one set up for first person view, but I'm doing that through an external monitor and not through my phone. So anyway, so those are the models. Um, this is uh, Buzz right here. And most of the stuff that I'm working with, and most of the time, you know, particularly when I'm doing my aerial photography, I'm flying Buzz. This is my uh, go to uh, quadcopter, my favorite one right now. And, uh, and you can see it's on a case. I got this hard shell case. Um, it's a Go Professional case. And I got it off uh, Amazon. I think it was like 200 bucks for the case. And it has uh, foam on the inside, and it's really good for traveling. I take this on the plane. Um, all the time. So this is constantly, uh, you can put it in the overhead luggage and uh, and I have no problems with that. I will not park with this though. I will not let them put it in baggage. Um, I think Laurie has a story about that. Um, and the other thing too is you can always, always tell them you had the LiPo batteries and LiPo batteries have to be carry on anyway. So that way that prevents them putting it in the belly of the, of the aircraft. So um, here's another shot I've got here. This is actually a still frame from the video I was doing of the three different models. And you can see they all kind of fly and operate very similar. So um, let me just talk a little bit about some of the uh, pictures and stuff that you can get with these. And I'm just going to go in here. 
and I'll, I'm going to show you a few photos. Now, I have a few people I do need to credit for this. Um, the first one is Russell Brown. Uh, I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for Russell. He was the one that uh, got me into this, and um, and it's, it's very addictive, by the way. Um, if you <laughs> start doing it, so I'm not sure if I should thank him or curse him. Um, I'm, I'm kidding. I, I absolutely love um, flying these um, aerial quadcopter drones and taking photos with them. It's one of the most enjoyable things you can imagine. And once you do it, it's, it's just ridiculously addictive. So one is Russell um, got me into this. And then uh, he introduced me to a couple of guys and uh, we've become good friends now and have really helped me a lot with the technical side of things. And that's uh, Romeo Duscher and also Mark Johnson. Um, these guys are the uh, you know the key masters of quadcopter, so to speak. They are really really great with all the electronics and all the technical side. So when they see me calling, they probably won't ignore the phone call because they know I'm going to be like, "Hey, what transmitter should I get for this?" Or, you know, I'm I'm putting a transmitter on here. Uh, how should I wire this up? <laughs> so I, anyway, I've learned a lot from Romeo and Mark, and and another uh, couple of friends that I have. I have also um, have helped me a lot. We've flown together, and I've learned some good stuff from is uh, Barry Blanchett and Jeff Foster. So um, you know, those are my DJI buddies, and of course, uh, your very own Laurie there. Um, we've we've flown together, and uh, and she's a great pilot as well, and great photographer. So anyway, let's move on and look at some pictures, so we can get kind of an idea of what we can do with these things. So I'm just going to start with this. It's just kind of a fun thing here. Uh, let me just bring that up there. And this is uh, what I call a tiny planet. And I have a tutorial on my website on how to do this. And basically, this is me flying. Uh, this is Snoopy. And you can see I'm right there at the beach. This is a Laguna Beach. And I created this 360 degree panorama and put everything together there. And then I just composited Snoopy in there. So this was not another quadcopter <laughs> taking a picture of it, which would be amazing flying if that was the case. Um, so anyway, so that's a picture from there. Let's go through. Sometimes you can do special effects, and I was just kind of experimenting with this. This is at the Great Park in Irvine, and I just uh, made these 3D model airplanes and put them in in Photoshop just for fun to kind of give it a video game look. Now here's something that is, uh, I got this on my first quadcopter. This was shot on the GoPro, and uh, I was able to pull this frame from video. And uh, this is in my earlier days. I was out flying, and all of a sudden, this pelican just comes just gliding in underneath my quadcopter. And when I saw that happen, I just knew that I had a winning shot, and uh, I'm just absolutely thrilled with this shot. And uh, the only thing I did with this, as far as retouching, is I put a little bit of a vignette around the edges here because I wanted to draw attention to the bird, and I also took out the shadow of the quadcopter. Maybe I should have lifted it, I don't know. But uh, as you can see, you know, real fun. And these are the happy accidents that happen when you're flying. Uh, this one here is in Hawaii. This is a panorama. So a lot of what I do with the aerials is I do a lot of panoramas where I might take four or five or six photos and uh, stitch those together. Now, when it comes to shooting the panoramas, when I'm using the Vision or the Vision Plus that have the app, I can look through the app and I can see. And what I normally do is I, I look at a particular feature and then I'll rotate and keep that fit feature in the frame. Usually I'll have it at like about a third of the way in, and then I will rotate it until it's about a third of the way out. So it's I'm, I'm keeping a lot of overlap, more than I normally would. Um, typically for a panorama, you want about a 30% overlap. Uh, but with these, because of the fisheye lenses and uh, and you know also when you get closer to things, you get a lot of parallax or whatever. I like to have a little bit more overlap on these. Um, with the GoPro, what you have to do is just either take the frames from video or you can shoot the camera, um, set the camera up to work in a, in a time lapse and take a photograph, you know, once every second or once every three seconds and then rotate it between shots that way. Um, I find that when I do that with the GoPro is I generally will leave it for two shots for each uh, image because I don't want to be taking a photograph while rotating because I could get some motion blur on it. Um, here's LA, so this is downtown LA. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit and make this um, a little easier to see. So this is another panorama I did of downtown LA, and I flew up, and I thought it was really cool because I've seen you know, panoramas from LA from ground level. I've seen them from the air, but only with a quadcopter could I do this at eye level halfway up the buildings. 
can't do that for helicopter because a helicopter can't fly that low, not legally, and um, you know, so I was able to get a really unique perspective on downtown LA, and I just love this because I love all the little curls and everything of the road going into the city. I think it it tells a really great story. Um, let's go look at a couple more here. This is at Pelican Point. You can see uh, we've got this uh, wonderful uh, lighthouse there. And uh, let me just zoom through some of these a little bit. This is uh, the LA Convention Center. This is another panorama, but this is a, a vertical panorama rather than horizontal, which is why we've got the weird shape on the LA Convention Center. But I thought it was kind of fun. But I also love the light, the sun coming behind it here. And on video, that looks really great. Um, here's another local shot, and I do a lot of these kind of photos, so I fly a lot down at the beach here in uh, South Orange County, and uh, you can see here, this is uh, really cool, this is Heisner Park, which is right near uh, Laguna Beach, and look at how beautiful the water is, and in a second I'm going to show you how I process these, and you'll see how we can really bring out the details in a lot of these photographs like this. Now here's another GoPro one. I'm just going to race through the pictures here really quick. Um, and but I just did want to mention here, sometimes you want to come in close and get a different kind of angle. Not everything you want to shoot from 400 feet up in the air. Um, here's at downtown LA. And you can see the convention center, the JW Marriott, the Ritz-Carlton. The whole skyline here is kind of fun. Um, and here's another one that I did from a still frame from a video. And this is using the 2.7K uh, camera on the GoPro and taking taking a shot and you can see it's really crisp and sharp and clean and this is Huntington Beach or Huntington Pier and I did this one about a week ago and uh, Griffith Observatory um, I was standing down here somewhere flying uh, this one here is the one that was used for the webinar this is Great Park and this is looking directly down on a hot air balloon that actually creates this ball it's actually a balloon that flies and I went up early in the morning before they were flying the balloon so there was no hazard or anything like that. Uh, this is Echo Park. You've probably seen it on a million TV shows and videos uh, and movies. It's used a lot. Um, usually not in good light. That's where all the gangs meet on uh, Sons of Anarchy and stuff. <laughs> um, but there's downtown LA in the background there and beautiful Echo Park with the fountain. So I was able to fly up and have the fountain in the shot. And this is as on a yacht. I was actually a sailboat, I guess Americans call it. Uh, my accent is from New Zealand, so sometimes I use New Zealand vernacular. Um, and this is not me with the ripped abs, that's my, my buddy. Um, this is me sitting here geeking out on the boat. And uh, of course, we've got some guys doing a selfie at the front. And so I was actually able to fly off this boat just um, and follow it and get some uh, photos and some video while we were flying around. It was a lot of fun. Um, this is Del Mar. And um, this is actually. Uh, near where MacFun's headquarters are in the U.S. And that's another panorama. I was with Laurie, actually, when we got this shot. And here's a HDR. So you can actually do HDR here. And this is Corona Del Mar. And you can see a lot of the, the detail and stuff in there. And uh, this is the hangers. Um, you've probably seen these in Irvine, Tustin area. And these are giant. These used to be blimp, blimp hang, hangers for, um, for blimps. And you can see, you know, there's the vehicles and the people, the doors down there, very, very, very large. Um, and this is was actually used in Sky Captain, World of Tomorrow, on the movie, and I've shot American Idol in there and, and all kinds of movies and shows. Um, so anyway, that's that. So why don't we jump in and look at a little bit of the process. What I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a really basic panorama. I've got a lot of panoramas here and a lot of the panoramas I like to, uh, you know, I really enjoy working on those. So I'm just going to grab a really simple one. It's just three images and basically what it's going to be is going to be this one here. This is downtown Laguna Beach. So uh, I've got the three shots here and typically what I'm, I do, and let me just um, reset. I'm just going to clear these settings so I can do this from scratch. and Let's go here. So what we've got is three of them selected. Now what I want to do is I want to open these in camera raw. Because the first thing I need to do is I need to get rid of the lens distortion. Because as you can see there, you know, this kind of fisheye lens creates a lot of distortion on these. And if we want to stitch these together, we've got to get rid of that. So I'm going to choose select all. And then I'm going to select them all there inside of camera raw. And then 
we're going to go under the lens correction and under profiles, if we enable the lens profile, notice that there's a DJI uh, profile built right in here. So this will automatically get rid of the distortion on all three of those images. And I'm just going to click done. I'm not going to make any adjustments or anything like that. I'm just going to uh, get rid of the distortion. So we've got rid of that now and I want to merge these together into one image. So I'm going to go into the tools and I'm going to go down to Photoshop and this is where you will uh, access you know, things like HDR and photo merge and all these kinds of things. So photo merge is what we're going to use for stitching these together into panorama. So I'm going to click that. Photoshop CC is going to launch and now it's going to work on putting these together. So it's going to take these three images and I'm just going to use the auto and just click OK. And what it's going to do is it's going to look at these, it's going to look for similar features, it's going to look for overlap, and then it's going to put them together and then seamlessly um, stitch these three together into one image. And if it will, that did not go well. Um, that was not the result we were looking for. Mm, it doesn't matter. Let's just go back in here again. And what I'll do is uh, these should have stitched together. Maybe I just need to change the order of them. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up one here that I pre-stitched just to uh, save time and also so we don't have that, whoops, happen again. Okay, so <laughs> here we go. If we have these three images now stitched um, together and we put them together in a panorama, and this is what it should have looked like uh, when we did that. And one of the things that I do once I've stitched these together, you can see there's a couple of little gaps at the bottom there. So what I like to do is um, just to kind of, what well, this is once we've cropped it, I'm just going to hit the command key to make a selection. And you can see that selection is the area where all the uh, image pixels are. And outside of there is nothing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invert it. So I'm going to hit command shift I to invert the selection. So now what I've done is I've just selected down here these transparent areas. See that? So we've got one there and one on the other corner. And I'm just going to expand the selection because I'm just going to fill this up. So I'm just going to choose the select and then I'm going to choose modify expand and I'm going to expand this by, oh, 10 is probably sufficient. And then what it's doing is it's creating a little bit of an overlap now in that area and I'm just going to hit shift delete to open up the fill dialog box. Now I'm going to grab the content aware fill and then just click OK. And I'll make sure that this blending mode, yeah, let's keep it there, we'll just go there for now. And there we go. And notice that it just fills up those corners there um, and it's, it's, it's good enough. If it's not perfect, then what I would normally do is I just go back and then I run Content Aware Fill a couple more times until it looks good. And if I have problems, I'll use the patch tool and, and the uh, clone, scan, clone stamp tool sometimes as well. So anyway, so once we've put it all together and we've got a panorama, one of the things I really love is using uh, MacFun. So we're going to go into Filter here and I'm going to go down to the MacFun software and there's two applications I use, Intensify Pro and Tonality Pro. Now, I discovered Intensify Pro um, quite a while ago, and uh, Tonality is a newer product. But um, Intensify is really, really great for bringing out the details in aerial photography. Because there's a couple of things you know, that happen. You can see here, here's the shape, because I didn't crop that fully. Um, I actually preserved those pixels in there. That's why we've got this interesting little shape. And I, I want to keep it like that so you can see it is real, even though we had a little mishap earlier on. All right, so when we've got this, one of the things I love about this is, you know, we're using small cameras. The cameras are, you know, for the size of them, you know, you want to fly these cameras. It's all about size and weight. And because of that, we don't have big sensors. We don't have heavy glass. Um, unless you're flying, you know, a larger copter, but you know, I'm talking about the smaller ones that, that we like to fly. And so sometimes you don't get the crispest, crispest image. Um, and so that's what I love here about Intensify Pro is I'm able to bring back some of the detail. And also the other thing about it is these look brilliant when they're printed out. And uh, one of my friends, uh, Eddie Murphy from Epson, has printed out a number of my panoramas uh, for me at different shows and stuff and they just look wonderful really huge on these big you know three and four foot prints however you know if you want to share them online you want to share them on Facebook or 
uh, with frames, a lot of that detail gets lost. So what we want to do is bring back some of that detail and, uh, and bring out some of that information. Uh, the other thing too, of course, you know, on the prints, this works really well as well. So it's not just for online. So we can do the basic tune here, which, you know, we're going to go in and we just would set things like our exposure, shadow, and highlight. So if we wanted to, you know, maybe recover some of our highlights, we can pull that down. If we want to open up some of the shadow detail a little bit, we can open that up a little bit. So um, that's looking pretty good. Now, typically you would want to just push the contrast up and recover some of the contrast, especially if you push these really hard. In fact, why don't I push these harder just for fun? And I'm not going to recover the contrast here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go down and use the Pro Contrast. But before I do that, I'm going to pull back just a little bit on the vibrance. Because what happens sometimes when you start to open up these shadows and highlights is the image can start to look a little overly saturated. And I don't want that with my colors. I want it to look more natural. So let's go down to the Pro Contrast. And under here, this is you know where we can really make things happen. So a lot of the time, I generally just pull these up to about halfway. So I'm not doing anything right now. I'm just pulling these up to halfway. And you can see right now, you know, if we click on here, you can see the before and you can see the after. There's a lot more detail showing right now. But now I go under the offset. And then with the offset, you can really start to tweak these. Now this sky is just blown out. It wasn't captured. There's no way to get this back on this particular image. So I would probably do a sky replacement on that one. But for now, why don't I move these, the highlight offset until it looks good for me on the highlights. And I'm kind of liking that there. And these are bright enough without losing the detail. Now let's go to the mids. A lot of what happens will happen here in the mids. See that? We can just really make this image come alive. And then we're going to grab the shadows. And I'm going to go back this way a little bit so we can have a little bit more shadow in the image. And now if we look at this before and after, you can see it just really is bringing this to life as far as uh, bringing out the detail here. Um, we're not talking about sharpening or anything like that or bringing out any of the uh, textures or anything just yet. All we're doing is looking at the overall balance of the adjustments. And if you want, in this case, I might even go back to the basic and open up the exposure a little bit more and just brighten up that whole image. So sometimes I'll go back to the exposure after working with the contrast. So now this is where we go down here. We're going to go into structure. Now under structure, this is where we can bring out the texture of the images. Now you can work in global or micro. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to jump into micro and grab the midtones here right now, just so you can see this one. And we're going to pull this one up. And notice as I do that, you can see how much detail we're able to bring out there in the midtones. You can see on the road there, you know, where the tires have been going, all that detail starts to come out now. Uh, so you'll get, you know, we can play around with the highlights and the shadows, of course, as well. And, uh, and also in the global. And I, I generally start in the global, but in this particular image, I just wanted to just do the mid-tones because this is where you're going to see most of the difference. Let me show you what happens in the highlights. So we can go up here, but there's not, you know, a lot in the highlights here because the sky is blown out. So typically I save the highlights for the sky. So I'm not really going to bother with it in this image. You could also play around with the shadows if you want to bring out more texture. But in this case, I'm just going to leave it right there. I'm kind of happy with that. And then we can go down to our details here. Now, this is where you can enhance the details. And uh, before I do, let me show you where we are now. See, this is before and after. Notice how much uh, detail we're getting out of here. In this particular image, I'm trying to keep this one very natural looking. I'm not trying to make this one look processed. You can do a whole faux HDR if you go really, um, uh, you can very easily do that in here if you want. But in this case, I don't want that. So we can have a look here and let's uh, look at some of the details here. We can move around some of the small, medium, and large. We can do them globally, which just kind of gives a sharpening kind of an effect. We can do it just in the highlights or the shadows. So let's have a look. I'm just going to do global on this one. And let's have a look and see what we get when we do the medium. So if we do that, notice it just gives us a little bit more sharpness. Let me look at that before that way. Or we go the other way, you can see it's just opening up some of those uh, details there. Let's try the large just a touch. I don't want to go too heavy on that. And notice how that can really affect the image. And we look at this before and after. Now it's really making the image pop. 
And of course, we've got the small. We can do the small here. Um, what this will do is it'll bring out the detail and the sharpness in some of these little small areas. Notice how that it kind of make it look a little speckly. Um, so a lot of the time, I don't use the small that much, particularly at this resolution. If I was doing print, I might push the small just a little bit, and it really depends on the image and also if I want a more faux kind of an effect. So here we go, and also if you want to go down there, you can also go to the micro sharpness, and you can sharpen that even more. But I feel like this image is sharp enough, so um, we don't really need that in there. So let's have a look at the before and the after. You can see, you know, wow, we've really brought out a lot of detail and texture. And um, you know, and this is, you know, we've zoomed way out on this. So let's zoom in a little bit, and you can see the detail here as we're zooming in. And this is just a forty percent. That's before and after. Notice the detail that's showing in the tiles. Notice in this little tower here, look at this before and after. And you can actually choose a split screen too if you want to see that before and after. And you can see, you know, particularly for things like bricks and concrete and, you know, up here, the tree. Look at the detail in the tree, the roof. Um, and it's just wonderful. Look at this background here. Um, so, you know, I just love, absolutely love using Intensify Pro on my aerial photographs, and, and you can see why. I mean, it's just bringing out so much detail. It's wonderful. All right, so let me uh, just zoom out a little bit. We can just choose to fit. Now, there's other options, too. If I want presets, I can click on here, and I can just do that. And I'm just going to save the preset. I'm just going to click Add, and now I've got my preset. Now, here's another thing you can do. If you feel like, you know, I like this, you know, you can also click, by the way, on the image to see it before and after. If you feel like, I love this, but it's just a little much, can we dial it back a little bit? Sure. What we can do is go up here, and we just pull up in our layers. And on our layers, we can actually blend that in as much as we want. So I'm just going to pull that up, maybe pull it back there, make it more subtle. And we can also create multiple layers on there. We can do masks, so we can paint on certain portions there and have certain portions affected where other portions are not affected. So we can apply different adjustments to different parts of the photograph by simply grabbing these, these brushes here and uh, you know if we wanted to do it that way. Um, I'm not going to do it on this particular image because this, this one really doesn't need it. Um, and also if we go under presets here, you'll see there's my preset and also there's a whole bunch of presets that I've created. So um, you know there's an aerial preset that I've been working with there. There's another one I've got. And, um, and you can see with these different presets, you know, we get different looks. There's something that's pushed a lot further. And once again, all of these presets, you can always dial these back. So um, let me show you something actually while I'm out doing this. Let me hit Laguna. So there's the Laguna one. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a new layer. Put a new layer on top. So it's duplicated it right now. And let me grab one of these, um, probably this one here. Okay, and then if I want to pull this one back a little bit, and so I just wanted to show that detail somewhere, now I could go up here and I could grab this brush, and now as I paint with this brush, what it's going to do is it's just going to paint this in where I want it. So maybe I just want it in this area. Notice now what I'm doing here is I'm painting in the details from that top adjustment now. See, there's a mask that's showing. If I turn that off, there's the uh, one that I just edited. Here's one on the top of a preset on top, so I'm just certain areas I want to bring more attention to. I can paint those in just like this by using the brush. So you can start to mix and match different presets together and create some really nice looks. So if we look at this now before and after, you can kind of see uh, what we're able to do. Um, and once again, you know, we can always go back, adjust these later on too, so you're not stuck with. Um, exactly what happens. If I go to adjustments here, you can see here I am in the adjustment and this is the one I applied the preset to, but I can still change this later. So if I feel like you know I want to change the highlights a little bit, I can do that there. And notice it has a little bit of yellow there that shows you where things have been adjusted and where things have been um, moved around so you can very, very easily find where those changes were by simply you know clicking on those. And we can see here I used the global adjustments on that one and you can adjust them again because the yellow shows exactly where they've been moved from. So when you go 
back there and there's no yellow, that's just its default position. All right, so that's one image. Let me just cancel out of there. And um, you can kind of see that's Intensify Pro, and I absolutely love it. And honestly, I don't know of an aerial photograph or any photographs at all, actually, that don't look better putting a little bit of uh, Intensify into them. So uh, let me go back here now, and I'm just going to show you something else. Let me grab this one here, and I'm going to pop this up. And notice everything is called test, and that was because I exported these last night from uh, my Lightroom library. I'm just going to open this as an object. So this is a smart object. It's a raw file right now. This is a DNG shot from uh, my quadcopter because the, uh, the, the Vision and the Vision Plus shoot in DNG raw. So notice this is a smart object, and this is a DNG right now. So um, let's go in here, and I'm going to make some adjustments. So we're going to go under the filter, and I'm going to go under here, and now I'm going to grab Tonality Pro. And let's pop it open. And notice that this is working on a smart object with a raw file. So that is supported. Now, Tonality Pro is designed uh, mainly for working with black and white images and just creating really beautiful black and whites. However, you, it works really well on color pictures too. Pardon me. And what I've done is I actually made a preset here called color only. And what that does is actually under the color filter here is if you go under the saturation and you slide everything up, that will give you the original photograph in color. So if you wanted to just use the tools here inside of Tonality Pro on a color photo, you can do that. But I'm just going to reset because this photo here really could give itself really, really nicely to uh, a black and white. So one of the things that we can do on here, if you've got a lot of presets, if we look at the presets here, you'll notice I've got user presets, which are my presets down here that I've made. And we can try some of these. And we can see some of the different uh, looks that I'm able to get. I, I did this one last night. I called it Cheap Lens Center Focus. Um, we've got different aerial ones I've got, you know, a lot of these, there's the color one, and then we've got some kind of Orton Glow kind of things that I've been doing, experimenting with. Uh, gnarly Texture, Grunge Blue, Ocean. So, you know, as you can see, these are just some of my presets I've been making, and I am actually going to do a preset pack with, uh, here's an old time one, with uh, Make Fun Soon, and that'll be available in the future at some point. Um, but also under User Presets, these are mine, and these are all the ones that ship with it. So there's a whole bunch of 150 different presets that come with it. So here's some of the vintage looks. And you see you can very just quickly go in here and make some adjustments. So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm just going to hit Reset. And I'm going to do a couple of very quick adjustments in here. So the first thing, we're under the color filter. And uh, if you've ever, we're going to go to the luminance here, you can see that. Uh, if you've ever worked with make converting color photos to black and white, uh, and maybe you've used a black and white filter in Photoshop, or you've used a channel mixer, you're familiar with making certain tones that would normally, you know, like the reds, for example, making those either lighter or darker. So we can go under these different tones and adjust the lightness and darkness of the different areas. So you can actually do these under the presets here. You can put the uh, you know, leaning more towards the reds, the oranges, you know, the different colors here, and there's different ways to click in here for the adjustment. So I would start with something that looks good to me, and uh, starting to bring out some detail. If we look at this, you know, before and after, you can see there's quite a bit of difference. And then I might play around with some of these other tones here, and try and find some tones that are going to bring out more of the detail. So I'm just kind of moving these around and seeing how they affect different uh, tones on the image. So you'll notice that's looking pretty good. So here's a default and now that's with changing some of these. So let's go up under our tone up here and these are the two sliders that I just absolutely love, 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 love. Well, which is why sometimes I do my color images in here because we've got exposure and contrast but you know here's the standard exposure makes everything lighter, makes everything darker double click to reset, but check out this adaptive exposure. Look at this, we can make it brighter or darker without losing detail. So I'm going to pull this back, look at all this detail that's coming out now, and of course I can still use it with the exposure to brighten it up and bring out all this um, detail information. Now let's look at contrast. Contrast. A lot of contrast, very punchy, 
low contrast, washed out, looks like a dirty window, wants to be washed. Smart contrast. We get our contrast, but it doesn't blow things out. Or we go the other way, look at this detail that's starting to come out. Absolutely amazing. So I'm going to pull the contrast back this way, maybe to about there. And uh, you might feel like, wow, you know, look how much detail is coming out from there to there. All the detail now is showing in the concrete and around here. And what I want to do though is just grab the blacks and just push the blacks. We could go this way or we could go that way. See that lightens the more dark and stuff. And I'm just going to darken the blacks a little bit because I want to put some body back into this image. You can see the histograms just starting to touch there. And um, if we look at this before and after, we've brought out a lot of detail. So I'm just going to move down really quick because there's a couple of other things that I want to work with in here. Clarity and structure. So now that we've brought out you know, just showing the tones where we want them and the lights and the darks. It's definitely showing a lot more information in here. But now I want to um, craft this a little bit and give it a little more punch. So we've got clarity. Everyone loves clarity. Notice we can go very, very hard on that. Or we can just go a little bit. I'm just going to take it to about there. And now I'm showing a little bit of clarity, starting to um, pull that detail. And then we can also do the same thing with the structure. If we go into the structure here, we can increase the structure. And, um, you know, you could go a lot further on that. And once again, before and after, we're starting to bring out some of that detail, some of that texture, and same thing with the microstructure. We can play around that a little bit if we want to. If you go too far, notice it gets very, very textury. Almost looks like it's printed on a newspaper. And very low, just gets very, very soft. So you could soften these if you want by going negative. Uh, but what I'm going to do is just give it a little bit on the positive side here. And if you want to give that more, you can also boost that. And you can also use protection. And the protection will protect some of the finer areas of detail. But I kind of like what we've got there. You know, it's giving us a lot of this detail. I might come back on the structure, though. I think there's too much structure there. I'm going to pull it back to about there. And I like that result better. So. Let's go down to the last thing I'm going to show on this particular one is a split toning. And I want to give this a little bit of a color effect by um, giving a little bit of color in the shadows and the highlights. Sometimes for photographs like this, all I want to do is give it a little bit of saturation in the shadows. So we're going to go like that. You can see that's the shadow detail. So I'm going to give it just a little touch of color and I'm going to move this up more into the greens. And you can see it's just very, very subtle. And um, these can also be uh, easily enough uh, turned on or off by, you know, when we click on different areas here, I can go down here. There's my split turning there. I could just turn that checkbox on or off if I wanted to uh, show or hide that effect. But let's go down here. We're going to put a little bit into the um, highlights as well. Maybe give it a little yellowish tint. Mm, kind of orange. There we go. So we're giving that just a little bit of touch of color there too. And you can also play around with the balance and push it more towards uh, one of the colors or more towards the, this would be the shadow color that we selected, the green, or more towards the oranges there. So you can balance that up. And once again, before and after. So you can see how much detail we're able to bring out in there really, really quickly and easily. Now I did say I was only going to do one more thing, but I'm going to do two things real quick. I'm going to put a little vignette around here. Just going to darken that down a little bit around the edges. And that just brings more attention here because there was a lot of um, just stuff going on very, very busy around there. And the other thing you can do too is if you want to really focus the viewer, we've got this lens blur. And we can actually place the center if we want to place it in the hanger here and increase the amount where you could blur everything off and uh, focus just on there. We can move the center. If we wanted to put it on the balloon, we could go that way. And, um, you know, we could play around with the amount. We can pull that down a little bit. And you can see we're, we're able to do these kind of effects. Sometimes I might take this though and place it in the center and just put it between the two. So these um, pieces of information are really drawing the eye now. And uh, the rest of it can be kind of softened or blurred away. And that kind of creates a center of focus on the photograph. So now the focus is really on 
this part here, which is what the photo is about. The rest of the information is there to add support to the photo, add support to the story, and tell you, hey, we're at an airfield, but it's not drawing your attention away from the important part, which to me is the relationship here between this hangar and the hot air balloon. So, um, you know, also the layers and all that kind of stuff work right in here as well. So, um, I think we're getting close to time for questions and answers. So, I'm just giving you a little touch here on Tonality Pro and Intensify Pro. And I'm going to uh, hand it back to Laurie. So, Laurie, are you there? I am here. This is fascinating. <laughs> this is great. I think all of us have different uh, ways that we edit images. And so, it's always refreshing to see somebody take, you know, like an aerial photo like yours and, you know, adding a little lens blur and uh, it's, it's great. It's fantastic. Very nice. Um, I have one comment, by the way, Colin, you need to put stickers of the names of your copters on your copter. I do. I start to forget their names too. <laughs> <laughs> you need to do that. <laughs> um, and then uh, I just wanted to mention a couple things. And I've got a question from Lisa, but um, you had mentioned happy accidents. And I know it was about a week ago or so you were out flying and a whale just happened to pop oh. up. Oh, I have it right here. Do you want to see it? Yeah, I'd love to see it. Um, let me see. Oops, hang on a sec. I should not have tried to have got away with the, um, I forgot to apply my effect there. <laughs> Um, let's have a look here. We've got this on my desktop, and um, it was actually a dolphin. It's not a oh, whale, was it? but oh, uh, okay. yeah, but it's a huge one. <laughs> okay, it looked like a whale. <laughs> here we go, and uh, there we go. Look at that. Oh, oh wow! Yeah, it actually. Yeah, so down to the water. I was just um, actually doing an aerial panorama, and then right in the middle, um, decided to just jump up there, which really was amazingly cool. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. Yeah, I love that when that happens. <laughs> um, the other thing, too, is, you know, you really emphasize, you know, photographing below 400 feet. Everybody with copters, it seems like they want to fly up high, but there's so much wonderful detail and, you know, things that you can find when you're flying low. And it's great that you emphasize that. I don't think people emphasize that enough. Yeah, it's funny because um, you give someone a quadcopter and they fly as high as they possibly can and then you put the same person in an, in an airplane and they'll fly as low as they possibly can. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and uh, with that, Lisa was asking about restrictions. Can you kind of go over some of the restrictions like, you know, the height, the 400 feet limit and away from um, airports? Can you kind of give a brief sure. overview? Sure. Yeah, well, there's guidelines right now, FAA guidelines. Um, there, there's a lot of gray areas because they have not actually drafted real laws yet. Um, so these are guidelines and, um, you know, and as hobbyists, um, we, we should abide by these guidelines because the last thing you want to do is uh, be a cowboy and be the person that's responsible for these being banned. So, um, so the, the guidelines are um, fly beneath 400 feet. Now, the reason it's beneath 400 feet is because uh, civilian aircraft, their lowest ceiling is 500 feet. So it's nice to have a 100-foot buffer zone in between those. So you're not going to be uh, getting in there and flying and crashing into airplanes and helicopters, which really you couldn't. Um, there's actually a video on there of the wedge um, on YouTube, and you'll see that a Coast Guard helicopter flew in, and you know, and everyone's worried about, oh no, you're going to crash into helicopters. Not a chance. The blades from the copter blew all the Phantoms straight into the ocean. I mean, that just creates so much turbulence. You would not get your Phantom anywhere near a helicopter. <laughs> anyway, um, so having said that, uh, 400 feet, you want to fly within line of sight, which means that you keep your eye on it at all times. Um, you definitely need to be in line of sight because the RF uh, frequency has to be line of sight, otherwise you lose connection. Um, but it does have a uh, come to home feature, so that uh, will come back to you. Um, you don't want to be flying over built up areas like in the middle of cities and things like that. Don't fly over people, don't fly over animals. Um, just be responsible and use, use common sense. Now, don't fly near an airport, which is actually built into the firmware now where you can't even, when you're within restricted areas such as airports and stuff like that, um, your height is actually limited as you get further away from the airport and you get close enough to the airport it won't actually even take off. So uh, the, those are like the main... Uh, Did you want to kind of review what's on that? Uh, oh, sure. Sure, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of stuff on there. Um, 
<laughs> let me see if I can go and so some of the lessons I've got uh, I have it here in Chrome. Let me just click on here. Um, let me bring this up. I've definitely got some design work to do on here, but these are all the lessons on it. There's actually nine hours worth of content on here, and uh, and it covers. And the reason we call it a handbook is it covers you know everything from you know introduction here. Here's the copters, you know, quick start guide, you know, just getting it out of the box and flying it. Batteries, care, propellers, prop guards, camera mounts, you know, all this stuff, uh, all the equipment, the cases. Then we get into the assistant software, which is where you connect to your computer and do firmware updates and calibration. Then we're talking about the Vision app, the app that comes with it on the phone. So a lot of information there. We've got the goggles. I'm using some uh, Mavarios from Epson for first-person view. Um, safety, of course, all is about safety. Flight control, how to fly it. Then we've got exercises here, where I'm literally taking people through different exercises on location for them to learn how to fly and build their flying muscles. So these are the kind of exercises you do over and over again to build some skills. Uh, how to recover from a crash, not a big deal if you have a crash. Uh, how to return to homeworks. Then we've got the IOC, which are more advanced flying modes. And these are kind of covered. Then we've got some stuff on location. We're using course lock, or it's just automated flying. Um, and we're seeing waypoints. And we're on location at the beach, also with some models chasing cars, uh, doing some kind of romantic uh, kind of filmmaking and doing filmmaking moves. So this is all like flying for video and uh, and photos. And talking about, you know, actually putting it together, how to enhance the aerial photos, uh, getting rid of that lens distortion for video and photos, um, doing aerial panoramas, you know, all the tiny palette, you know, HDRs, all different kinds of things here working. We've got MacFun plugins, so we've covered that. And here, Intensify and Tonality Pro. Um, how to get photos from video. You know, all this kind of stuff, editing the videos in uh, Photoshop, editing it in um, the GoPro software here. Um, also, Premiere Pro, so I've got a little 30 minute video there that shows a complete beginner how to edit Premiere Pro. Um, you know, stabilizing shaky footage, all that good stuff. GoPro Studio, which is free, comes with it. Then we've got some guest stars. We've got Dr. Brown, Russell Brown here. He's got um, a lot of stuff he's talking about that's really useful. And uh, Mark Johnson is talking about all his gadgets and gear. And then Romeo, of course, is talking about how to travel with a quadcopter and uh, and also first-person view. We've got Jeff Foster talking about shooting with video. And then we've got some stuff here where I'm just talking about positioning. This is a photo shoot we did with Benjamin Von Wong. And, uh, and I was also using uh, the quadcopter for that and how to use that in uh, a practical situation. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of stuff on there. <laughs> That's a lot. That's great. <laughs> Okay, well, this has been great. Um, Colin, you're uh, just a fantastic instructor. Always enjoy doing webinars with you. I hope you'll come back again. And um, thank you for offering this great tutorial lesson for all of us. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, and we'll talk to everybody later.